Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the 56th episode of Dhamma Pari Yesana, uh, where in which uh, we've been discussing interviewing scholars, senior scholars, junior scholars, and professionals uh, uh, on all modes of uh, uh, fields. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure for me to welcome uh, today's guest, uh, Dr. Benjapon uh, Jombunu who's a recent uh, PhD graduate uh, from the uh, IBSC, uh, International Buddhist Studies College uh, at uh, Mahachula Lankor Raj Yali University, Thailand. The reason why I invited her was that uh, her thesis uh, falls on uh, uh, an intersection between uh, right speech samavacha and uh, how samavacha, right speech, can be used as a tool for uh, communication so that uh, it can uh, bring about peace uh, plus uh, uh, she is uh, uh, you know adding more weight onto the peace studies uh, which is a uh, not a new concept but uh, I think the studies have been really uh, new and then uh, innovative to all of us so we'll see how that uh, goes at the same time uh, uh, I wanted to re uh, paraphrase uh, Dr. Benjamin Holmes, uh, bio a little bit. Dr. Benjapon Jombunu is a visiting lecturer of English at uh, Mahachula Dongkhor Raja Vidyali University, Thailand. At the same time, uh, she also uh, is a visiting lecturer at the Kapal Mongi University, Silpakorn University, and uh, Srina Kharin University. Sorry for my pronunciation, but <laughs> uh, they are all in Thailand. She holds a BA in English teaching from the Faculty of Education and an MA in English from the Faculty of Arts uh, from the famous uh, Chula, La Chula Longkorn University in Thailand. Uh, looks to be that uh, you have uh, an English background. That's why you uh, also teach English at the same time. She has a passion for Buddhism and music and plays the piano. I think the piano is behind her at the moment. <laughs> I don't, I don't think she's going to play piano today and was a piano instructor and uh, accompanies in the past. And interest, she can just to pursue. Okay, so Dr. Benjamin, welcome to our discussion interview today. How are you doing today? Okay, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dr. Chen Chimai, thank you for having me today and fine today. Thank you. And you said that uh, you are a little tired uh, since you were teaching yesterday the new new semester which just started yes that started yesterday are you yes, catching up to energy <laughs> yes yeah that's fine <laughs> oh great so let's uh, move on to our interview discussion too now right speech right speech is such a, a wonderful uh, topic uh, to all of us not as a soteriological point of view in Theravada Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism, we know the right speech is under the, the, the famous, uh, what do you call the Noble Eightfold Path, Arya Atanka Mantra. And it actually uh, represents uh, a, a bigger part of our life. As you mentioned in your thesis, uh, communication. Because every time when we uh, speak, we communicate. You say in your uh, thesis, which you finished last year, that even the even the what you call a baby is trying to communicate uh, with uh, his or her mother. So communication starts from that kind of an inception. It's not a new thing to all of us. But what is a wholesome speech? What do you mean by wholesome here? Uh, who's the kind of wholesome kind of speech? And how does this right speech uh, promotes his true communication? So this is our emphasis here. So before we jump on to uh, the, the right speech uh, and uh, you know communication through a peace model, uh, could you elaborate on uh, the, the intersection of right speech and uh, the communication? How do we how do we understand right speech and communication? Uh, I think uh, we can do a short uh, answer to this, and then we can proceed. So, um, for right speech, uh, the word speech here, we may think about what we speak or how we communicate as a message, uh, maybe in, uh, in verbal, nonverbal, or 
written form. So we cannot um, live with ourselves and stay silent and do not talk to anyone or uh, not sending any message to anyone. So I think communication is quite important in our daily life. And also um, the message that we deliver is also really important that we should have a constructive speech rather than destructive one. Like you say, a constructive speech. Speech has yeah. to be always constructive. Constructive. Uh, yes, not a destructive oh. one. Yes. Okay. So how do we how do we figure out whether my speech is uh, destructive and constructive? I mean, as a basis, I mean, before we jump into the text, we will find out a lot of things. But what's the yeah. what's the what do you call uh, you know fine line between a destructive and constructive speech? So in general and. Um, Relating to Buddhist teachings, if we think about a constructive speech, we may think about um, how the Buddha, Buddhist teachings um, can be applied to our speech. So the word right speech may be coming to our mind that maybe it's some kind of, um, as we have the number four in our five precepts of the lay Buddhist, the number four, Musawata, maybe we think about this as um, the guideline for us to deliver a constructive one that we need to abstain from certain kind of speech and instead we should replace those certain kind of speech that a destructive one with something more constructive yes okay great so we're gonna uh, somebody can uh, kind of only person can think about musawa the, the fourth precept and that's the basis for this uh, constructive speech Okay, so let's um, uh, take time to look at some of the definitions of uh, right speech uh, from the Theravada Buddhist point of view. Now, as we know, right speech uh, comes under the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, which represents uh, Samavacha, which also has the opposite called uh, Muchavacha, wrong speech. Uh, okay, we'll start from there. So, what is Samavacha? What is Muchavacha? Uh, you know, generally speaking, what do they mean to you? So, uh, as like I mentioned before, that um, if we talk about musawata or the wrong speech, that is uh, how we uh, deliver some kind of speech like lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, and idle chatter. So we have just um, four kinds of speech that uh, in the five precepts here that the lay Buddhist people should refrain from. So this four kind of speech maybe when we think about um, what is right or what is wrong speech, then we can think about this word that uh, we should refrain from something evil, like these four kinds of speech. And then what about the right speech here as um, it is one in the uh, eight factors from the eightfold path. So the right speech here um, generally saying that, um, you know, what is wrong? So what is right is something opposite. So what is right maybe um, to, to begin with, with the easy one from lying, you replace the lying with some kind of truth, the truthful speech. Um, divisive speech you may um, replace by using the speech that uh, enhance harmony between other people. The harsh speech you may replace this kind of speech like um, the polite and pleasant words. And the last one, the idle chapter, you should replace the kind, this kind of speech um, uh, with something beneficial, something that will develop or enhance um, the knowledge or wisdom of yourself and other people. So let's begin Great. with these so, things. Yeah. So they are fourfold. The right speech is fourfold, uh, which goes by uh, not uh, lying, not uh, talking behind the back, that is not slandering, this is not and then not. Uh, uh, talking unpleasant uh, words, uh, harsh words, as you said, parusa uh, vacha, and then sampapala vacha, not being an idle chatter or a gossip too, right? Idle chatting and gossiping. Uh, they both can uh, enter this. Thing. Okay, now in the Mahachattari Sutta Sutta Majabhanikaya, Majabhanikaya 117, Sutta, which you mentioned in your thesis, it says that uh, uh, all the what they call path factors, samaditi, sankapta, vacha, kamanta, ajiva, vayama, sat, samadhi, all these path factors are uh, always run by 
must be supported by three main factors or uh, sama piti, uh, sama sati, sama vaya, which means now in order for all of us to understand this is uh, wrong speech, this is right speech, we need right view, right? Kind of a view, okay, this is right, this is wrong, this is right, so right uh, view. And then uh, we need some effort because our energy can run out all the time because we are, when we are busy, when we are too tired, uh, we may have less energy uh, to combat, to fight with some of the unwholesome things. And then some uh, sati means we should be able to supervise ourselves. That's why uh, we need some uh, sati. So how do you see these three supportive uh, or supporting part factors? For sama vacha. Is sama vacha a standalone practice? Just because you want to do, can you do that? Or, according to uh, the Mahachatta, this is the Sutta Madhya 170, we have to practice right speech with these three path factors, supporting path factors. How, how do these three uh, help according to your studies in your teaching? Well, I think um, if we talk about communication, maybe what comes first, maybe. Um, the word of right speech because uh, the word is quite explicit that the speech is about the message that we deliver or uh, even the message de deliver or even the message we receive so if you think about communication maybe you think about the right speech as a surface level but right speech alone cannot um, do its work in order to bring peace, maybe there are some other elements, some other qualities. Like according to um, the Eightfold Path, we we have eight factors as a path to peace. So I cannot say that only right speech can do itself. So it needs other things in order to to know what is right and wrong. You may think about uh, the first one, samadhi, the right view. You need to have the right view first. You need to have uh, the true information as your guideline. And then you have uh, your good intention in order to perform your right speech. Also, you need to have your effort to practice in order to, to have a uh, right speech. And maybe you can start from uh, something a little bit like today you will start from um, refraining from lying and replace it with the truthful words. So you have good intention. You have uh, your, your information as your guideline, and you also try to practice. Maybe you can get a little bit bit by bit, and then you add more. Yes. Great. And um, I saw that you've been uh, talking about, um, we are not going after one by one of your PhD thesis, but I saw some of the interesting uh, sections of your thesis. Uh, you're talking about uh, some of the keys that lead us to write speech. I mean, so let's say some habits, because although we know that this is good, this is bad, sometimes we are not able to, uh, what you call, single out our focus. That's why there are some other suttas where uh, they talk about some of which means not, not lying, not slandering, uh, not uh, uh, using harshful words, and then uh, not being an idle chatter or a gossip. It is said that. We have to use uh, our words, I mean, at the right time, call it Kali in a Chabahasita. And we have to uh, speak uh, the truth, what you call Sacha uh, Chabahasita. We have to speak affectionately, Sankhan Chabahasita. We have to speak beneficially, Atta Sankhita Chabahasita. And we have to speak with a mind of loving kindness, Metta, Metta Chitena. Now, speaking at the right time, speaking in speak speak the truth. I mean, we are supposed to talk the truth, uh, and then uh, speaking affectionately, speaking beneficially, speaking with metta. Now, how are these angles? Let's say let's make them as habits. Right? How are these practical to all of us? I mean, how do we how do we practice these habits? Uh, so that we are able to practice some of it. So, uh, like as I mentioned before, that uh, first we need to know about what we should refrain from, and then we should replace those speech with certain kind of constructive speech. 
So this is is like uh, our goal that we are going to make it happen, make it become our habit. But I think that as as you mentioned, like the five factors, those five factors are the well spoken speech. I I view them as a, a criteria for us, a criteria for us to take a look and to check our message before delivering. Also. The criteria to check our message why we are delivering, and also to check after we deliver the message whether it is um good enough or is that something we need to practice. So those five factors are the well spoken speech, or it is called in Bali as um supasita vacha, consists of. And we mention again that um the speech that we deliver should be proper in time. The first one, the second, it should be truthful. The third is affectionate. The fourth one is beneficial, and the last one, the that speech should be delivered with loving kindness. So, for example, I think um this cannot um this this can be practiced each one, but actually these five factors should. Need to be considered at the same time as much as you can. For example, um, sometimes truths ha have to be considered whether you can talk about the truth all the time or not. It also depends on the proper time. So now I'm talking about these two factors, like the truth, the truthful speech. That uh, we need to say truthful speech, right? But You need to consider the time that is suitable to talk. Um, for example, some truths we know that it's the true words, but we cannot say it. For example, if we um, meet someone that he has just lost his loved one in family, maybe he just lost yesterday, maybe his uh, mom or dad died yesterday, and then the truth is that. Everyone will die, right? Everyone will die. No one can stay forever. But some kind of this truth we cannot say at that time because this person is already um uh, desperate, is overwhelmed with sadness. So we have to think. We have to have some consideration about the time. What is the proper time to talk about the truth like this? So. Sometimes we have good intention that we want to say some truthful words, but you deliver it in um, inappropriate time, so your speech will become destructive. Your speech will harm the other person. So this is must be careful. So consideration is really important to think whether some kind of truth can be said at the time or not. And uh, other factors, for example, um, like affectionate and benefic beneficial speech. So this is quite um a big part to talk about. This can be um take a look on uh, how you use the language, like uh, the word choice or uh, the sentence that you use. What kind of sentence, for example, um let's think about when when you feel that. Someone make you feel annoyed or sad. Most of us, when we see that person, we will kind of respond with uh, like um reactive response, and we say that you don't listen to me, you hurt me, something like this. Um, take a look. Um, be careful about your your structure use here. In uh, defensive response, we usually use um the language that is called. You language. It means that uh, when you talk, you think about the other person doing something to you, and you uh, speak like you don't listen to me, you hurt me, you ignore me. So this kind of you language is like blaming the other person. So um, this kind of language should be avoided. And instead of you language or uh, mentioning that you hurt me, you ignore me, let's replace the you language with the I language. With I language, think about yourself. Don't blaming other people. 
for example, like when you want to say that you don't listen to me, you hurt me, you ignore me, you may adjust um your sentence structure, your words, like um I feel hurt. Um, it seems like um you are not really listening to me, and I feel ignored. So you you will see that um. This kind of sentence uh, maybe a little bit longer, but it also constitutes quite the same message, but it is more affectionate, and it is better that you will talk about your feeling. You are not blaming the other person. You are talking that you feel like the other person seem to be like this or like that, but you you do not judge the other person that. You are hurting me. You are ignoring me. So I think if you keep something in mind, if you want to try to be affectionate and beneficial speech, it will reflect how you try to practice to uh, to use the word choice and the language. So this is um, one example about the language use of uh, replace you language with I language. Maybe I think it's it's quite difficult to practice, but it will be very beneficial if we can try bit by bit, day by day. That will be better. That we will focus more on ourselves, our feelings, rather than focus on um how the other person uh do this and that to us, and we think that they are um hurting us, and we are blaming them. Um. Another one is um, it's like the use of question. Um, the question that you can talk to people, maybe uh, the better one, maybe uh, the the open question, like the when you ask question, how do you feel? How do you think about this? Rather than choose this, do you like it or not? Choose this, or um, why do you doing this? Uh, Instead of this, you may uh, adjust your question like. Um, you mean uh, giving it, choices? Yes. Giving choices to the other person, right? Yeah, giving choices, and they can express uh, their thoughts and feelings more rather than uh, get uh, commands from you. Yes. But I have a I have a kind of question to that thing. Why why do people not uh, like giving choices to other people? Why they always uh, want to? Do, some people want to say, "You had to choose this. You had to choose this, whether like or not." Why? I mean, all this is true, but why it happens? Why it happens, right? Um, yeah, I why? think this this happens to everyone, right? <laughs> yeah, it happens to it happens to everybody. Yeah. But why? Yeah. I mean, what do you think from your research? Why this happens? Yeah. Um, from my opinion, this from come from ourselves. About ourselves, we attach to ourselves, and when we attach without knowing it or not, everything will come from our self, like the self center. So we perceive everything, we interpret everything from our own perspectives rather than looking about the other person because we are attached to ourselves. What what. Um, but shouldn't but shouldn't we yes. shouldn't we have an att attachment to us too? I mean, I mean, uh, it, it's a very uh, good thing to discuss. I mean, we cannot say that we should not attach to us because we have to do our things too. I mean, I'm talking from the normal person's perspective. So I think it, it needs a kind of a balance. Uh, we should not only only think about us. We have to think about others too. So I think this is the problem. So I think it's like um, uh, over maintenance of one's own ego, I guess. So what are your thoughts about this ego, managing ego? That's why all this thing happens. Mm -hmm. So uh, apart from the thinking of, of ourselves, right? So some, someone think about ourselves too much and then they won't listen to other people. You may oh. see that. And someone thinking about their self, um, whether they know it or not, and they think that they should do something to other they they become like a people pleaser. They try to please everyone. They yeah. try to help everyone too much, and this is some kind too, of too altruistic. I mean themselves. Mm. Yes. 
yes it's come from from the same source i think but but different directions yes so yeah. what what yeah. we should do that is we need to observe ourselves why we are doing this why we are doing that what are we going to do it depends on you need to see the the parts or the rules of your intention or your action if you can just just observe bit by bit try to observe maybe you want to command someone why because you um rely on your own perspective too much or if you want to please many people to help many people why maybe um the deep inside you want those people to respect you to love you or what so if you can go deeper to see your intention and your action i think you will understand yourself better and um gradually understand other people too yes okay great um i think uh, i kind of uh, came up with some of the how the questions to your analysis of uh, what you call uh, how uh, are these five keys leading to uh, right speech now let's uh, go back to the first point you said that we had to speak the truth but we had to know the time so that means are we allowed to lie at that point how do we do that let's say i'm supposed to i'm supposed i'm supposed to speak the truth but it's not the right time because if i speak the truth there may be a fight two people going to fight uh, maybe something else so what should we do i mean uh, to all those folks watching this um from my view that if you cannot say the truth at that time maybe you know there are many kinds of truth be some some truths cannot be said at that time some truths can be said or sometimes um if you want to say that truth like the, the truth number one cannot be said but truth number two three four can be said maybe you can try number two three four and number one let's wait for the proper time let's wait for the other person to be ready let's wait for the proper place proper situation and let's see that and another one is that if truth number one from your consideration um if it is truth but you consider that um the listener is not ready to accept the situation is not good and if you say this true it will be harmful so you don't mention it maybe it's a skip and wait for some other time or adjust them to something else yes but the situation i've been thinking is a worst case scenario let's say i will give you kind of a mythical example somebody is trying to kill someone so he's going faster and they're knocking somebody's door and saying that somebody's chasing me to kill me So please uh, let me in. I'm gonna actually hide because other person's gonna, somebody's gonna follow me. And that person says, "Okay, yeah, I'm helping you. I always take care of uh, Bean's life. So you go underneath the uh, bed. Uh, you go in there. I'm gonna protect you. And the next person who's gonna kill that person is gonna come and knock the door, asking, 'Is somebody like that coming? Oh yeah, he came in because I, I never uh, lie to anybody.'" I'm protecting, taking care of the fourth piece at Musawada Liraman. So uh, he went down over there. He is under the uh, bed. Now the problem is, this is accurately speaking the truth, but not at the right time. But there is no other choice seeming. So it looks like he has to, he has to tell a lie uh, if he really wants to save that person, right? So now it means that, as you said, the switching the truth. Truth one, two, three, four, five. As you said, if you can't say the first truth, you're gonna move the second. But this kind of a situation uh, is an exception. It won't, it won't help. So what can that person uh, do in such kind of a situation? Also, although seemingly something is not truthful, but if you have good intention, because karma is intention, not the action, right? The action, speech is what you show to other people. But what if somebody has the good intention? So how does that good intention, and probably such people may lie. So how how do we understand this? Is it is it okay? Uh, how do we uh, understand that? Kind of a contemporary view, actually. Well, I think this 
quite a difficult one to consider. It depends. Um, the one who comes inside your home, who is he? And the one that's um coming after, who is he? What kind of a person is that? So, uh, if uh, both of them are innocent, maybe um we may have uh, some answer different from um. If um, the one who comes inside to your house is um, a robber, and the one coming after is the police, so uh, I think it's it's quite difficult. It, you need to kind of uh, some kind of backgrounds of the situation, and it also depends on the person in the house. Um, I cannot say that we should do this and do that. Maybe people have different backgrounds, different intention, and um, and also um, different level of practice. Some person just uh, don't care much about practice. Some person cares a lot about practice. Some person cares about um, the life of people. Some person care about the correctness in their society. So I think this kind of uh, a lot of criteria to consider. But I think I I can I can say something. It's, can, it's not my, my be, choice. Yes. You can be and, direct about that. <laughs> and <laughs> I cannot be the example of of the person. That, the, yeah. the house owner. Yeah, so it depends. The, on, yes. The the the, the, the scenario here is that uh, when it comes to our life, uh, a lot of people they have to make quick choices. The best choice, uh, the quick choice, probably the most beneficial choice. So that's the place where they have to have a quick dis uh, decision based on. Outside. They they don't have a lot of time, so that that's why I'm trying to see this tricky part. Rather than saying, okay, we have to do this, we are not supposed to do this. So how does this uh, apply to this thing? But I know it's, it's it's kind of a difficult thing. So we will let that be up to the individual uh, decisions. Uh, I, what we're gonna say is that make the right and wise choice. Okay, <laughs> let's move on to the second uh, question. It's about peace now. We uh, know that the topic leads up to the peace because of Samavacha. So how does Samavacha lead to peace? Now, before we jump into that, let's uh, figure out the, the context of peace in Buddhism. Now, we have this uh, lofty understanding about peace called Nibbana. Nibbana is the peace in Buddhism called the inner peace, uh, probably the highest level of the inner peace. That means we are struggling, we are burning because of tanha craving. And the moment where we're gonna uh, stop that burning, extinguish, blow out that uh, uh, fire uh, that comes out of uh, Raga Dosa, a uh, great paper here, uh, the illusion, is the permanent peace. But here we're gonna be looking at peace from a secular point as well, because you mentioned we've done peace studies. So, how do you perceive uh, peace in Buddhism, both from the soteriological point, liberation point of view, as well as in the area of peace studies? Probably you can do a contrast. Uh, so, let's uh, begin with Buddhism first. As you mentioned, that uh, in Buddhism, we all Buddhists uh, have the highest goal that to be liberated. So, we can say that um, to be liberated from all defilements, from suffering to gain a permanent peace. Um, it's like um, the, the spiritual goal or the super mundane level. But in order to reach the highest goal, we need to start from the beginning and we move on each step. So from, uh, from the beginning, we may uh, have to uh, cultivate ourselves and try to attain maybe the peace at the mundane level or um, the worldly level. Like um, you try to be a better person, you try to um, uh, be good with other people, for example, with, uh, with the right speech in this kind of communication. So start from right speech at the um, worldly level before you practice into the highest goal of Buddhism to be liberated. So here, I think that uh, what is quite uh, similar in Buddhism and in peace study is that in Buddhism, we have uh, the goal, start from ourselves to practice ourselves 
to gain kids from inner kids, like we have to avoid unwholesome qualities and try to uh, cultivate and develop wholesome qualities. That is uh, something like we develop our inner peers. And when we are start doing our inner work, it's like we are um, cultivating our inner peers. And when we uh, have interaction with other people, our inner peers will reflect to other people, like how you uh, act or respond to other people with um, less greed, less hatred, less delusion, with more generosity, with more loving kindness, with more compassion and more understanding. So I think uh, this is quite like um, some sense in his studies that well, actually, in peer studies, we have many perspectives and many senses about peers. But the one that I think, as I, the one I think that is quite similar to what I mentioned, is about um, the negative and positive peers. So we we will focus on this too. The negative peers is that the absence of conflicts that um, no harm done to each other. If we compare to Buddhism, it's like when we try to avoid unwholesome qualities, you don't harm yourself, you don't harm others, but there is no conflict, but, but nothing, nothing else occur. The second sense is that um, the positive case, this is um, the presence and the maintaining of harmony, relationship, all good things. So. When we compare to Buddhism, it's like um, when we cultivate our wholesome qualities inside. And then after that, when we interact with people, we can spread out our inner peace to others. So I think uh, these two senses are quite the same in Buddhism and in peace studies. Yes. Great. I think I saw that uh, you've been talking uh, a period. Uh, uh, three periods of this, uh, what you call pos negative, positive, and uh, what you call contemporary time. And you're trying to say that uh, the, the, the nature of uh, peace has been changing over time from 1930 to 1955 because of the world wars that the whole world was having. Uh, they were not having lots of aspects of peace, but just expected uh, uh, a negative peace. And then uh, from 1959 uh, till 1990, uh, it has been a streamlined to uh, transformations and reductions of social inequalities, positive peace, uh, as you mentioned, peace. And then from 1990 to date, to the, to the time that we are now, uh, it has been going into uh, looking at different other tiny cultural uh, issues, like even cultural violence. So uh, that means peace studies have been taking different forms uh, depending on the time that we've been spending. Now we are at a good time. We've been looking at even small, tiny problems with the speech. Okay. So let's talk about the importance of communication now, because communication in general, not just the right speech. So how do we how do we bring right speech into communication and then promote peace? Now that's kind of a very uh, interesting uh, intersection. So let's talk about communication and then how uh, we see right speech as a part of communication and then bring about peace. Because uh, Dr. Benjamin Paul, you uh, have selected very interesting uh, sutras which I saw. Vikka Hika Katha Sutra, Sangita Nikai 56.9 and Tirachana Katha Sutra. I want to sort of like explain a little bit so that you can elaborate on that. Sangita Nikaya 56.9. Uh, 10. Now, in the Vigdahika Katha Sutta, there is something very interesting to all of us, even to monastics and non monastics. It says, Ma Bikkavi Vigdahika Katha Kateya. Uh, that means, monks do not try to argue with each other. On what? Now, some might think that uh, this argument is okay, even to Dhamma and Vinay. It says, Na Twang Imam Dhamma Vinaya. Uh, ajanas saying that uh, pointing towards somebody you don't know dhamma and winning uh, the sutras and uh, winnings aham imam dhamma vinayam ajana that means i know dhamma and winning very well then 
King Tuang Imang Dhamma Vinayang Ajahn says, Miksha Padipan, you have uh, come onto the wrong path. Ahamasmi Samma Padipan, I have come to the right path. So, same like this, if somebody is trying to argue, the Buddha said, This is really a bad activity. And he says, There is a reason. The reason is what he called by, because. These uh, discussions, these uh, topics are not conducive to uh, what you call uh, benef uh, benefits, uh, benefits of our spiritual life. Nadi Brahmacharyata, not relevant to the fundamentals of spiritual life. The Nibhidai, what you call uh, not for the for the dissolution, not to get out of the dissolution. The Viraga, not for the uh, dispatch. Uh, not for the cessation, Nibbanai, not for the extinguishment. So then the Buddha uh, promotes us to think about, have discussions on how to end uh, the suffering, especially uh, looking at the four uh, frameworks of the suffering. It says, Idam Dukkanti Kateyatta, Idam Dukkha Samudayanti Kateyatta, Idam Dukkha Nirodoti Kateyatta. That means we have to discuss discussions that lead to understanding the first truth. We reflect the first truth. Second truth, third truth, fourth truth. Now here there is something very interesting Dr. Benjamin, because even the monastics might not understand, even the lay people might understand that they might have arguments about Dhamma and Vinod. Because uh, if we bring right speech into a communication model, and then to look at some what you call the peace. How do we understand these teachings, especially um, this valuable teaching that we see in the uh, what you call Vigahika Kata Sutta, Sangita Nikaya 56.9. So, what are your thoughts about this? And then let's bring about uh, communication as a model for the peace through Samavacha. How can we develop peace through all that? So, uh, um, so thank you for mentioning this because um, this is um, the thing that I also in peace studies because uh, in in Buddhism we will say that uh, we we need to liberate from defilements from suffering and what you mentioned in the Sutta is that what should be avoided when you talk and in some way that uh, to to uh, to be in peace. So in in that sutta, the Buddha suggests that what we should talk is not about argumentative talk, but about uh, what is suffering, what is the cause, uh, and what, uh, what is um, the way of the suffering in order to reach our goal. And I think this is quite the same in peace studies, that in peace studies are we may, can, we may say that in conflict studies also, we do not uh, think about peace only because peace uh, is like a core that uh, one side is peace and one side is conflict. So from conflict, we can uh, go to peace. So in peace or uh, conflict studies, uh, we will um, view the conflict as something that is transformative. So we, we uh, do not we will not be desperate or get stuck with the conflict, but we try to understand the conflict. And I think the first one that when we accept that now we are having conflict and we try to understand conflict is like um, the first one in our vulnerable truth that we need to identify suffering, whether what it is, maybe uh, the suffering, maybe like um, you are hungry, that is your suffering, right? You can uh, use this in application and also in, in the same sense as in, as in case study that you identify the conflict first. And next, also in case study, after we identify the conflict, you know what is conflict, you try to find a cause, what are the rules of this conflict? The conflict like um, the iceberg uh, on, on the sea level, but under the sea level, you know, the iceberg may be really big. Where, how, how big it is, you need to find out that is the roots of the conflict. So I think it's like um, what we need to find in our noble truth. We need to find the causes of our suffering. 
and the third one in our vulnerable truth is neurota. And in this sense, in our contemporary life, neurota is like a mundane neurota uh, to get out of suffering uh, in, in certain way that we want. So we need to identify in this kind of suffering that we have, what is our neurota like you are hungry, you are, that is your suffering, your neurota like uh, now you are you are full, you can find something to eat, maybe that is your neurota. And the last one is the way lead to the peace or in Buddhism that is um, the, the eightfold path. So in your studies also you need to find what can be the ways to reduce the conflict, what can be the way to enhance peace in order to reach the, reach the goal that you set. So I think uh, you can adjust this uh, for noble truth in our contemporary life. Think about something easy in your life. Don't think about something like uh, um, the conflict in your countries or society. Maybe think about yourself first and try to adjust and apply. Now you can use the theory of peace studies and Buddhism at the same time. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, there was something interesting you added up added here. That was uh, conflict studies. I think it's it's one of the other side of the peace studies. Uh, mostly the people who study uh, peace studies, they also study conflict studies. As you said, it can it can be regarded as uh, you know the uh, iceberg of, of uh, the top of the uh, ocean because we don't see the problems. What are leading up to a conflict? Uh, in one of the suttas, in the Sutta Nipata, if I'm correct, uh, uh, it is named uh, Kalaha Vivad. Uh, that means these fights, uh, quarrels, arguments, they uh, they start as a reason of uh, maintaining uh, ourself uh, in a wrong way, the mismanagement of ourselves. That's why uh, uh, we don't see that part. We only see the conflict. Somebody did this. Somebody did that thing. Interesting. Okay, so let's uh, delineate about uh, barriers. I would say the barriers uh, in the context of peace promoting speech. Now we know right speech is uh, leading to uh, uh, peace. So then what can be the barriers, what you call confining things that stop somebody to have a peace promoting speech? Now, not even for individuals. Now, you can see even the geopolitical issues of countries, of the uh, nations, of the uh, different uh, leagues. So that means there can be some barriers uh, that we may not uh, be able to see. Probably there are visible factors. What are the barriers that stop individuals, countries, nations, uh, geopolitically, uh, stop promoting uh, the peace, especially uh, peace promoting speech? Okay, so um, I think in real life, communication, although we try to uh, deliver constructive speech or deliver, try to make uh, our speech to be right speech, but there are some barriers always occur. Um, uh, I would mention uh, two things, like the first one about the external factors that can be barriers. And the second one is internal factors of our communicators, like um, the speaker and the listener. The first one, external factors, like um, you are in a crowded place, a lot of noise, or in appropriate time to talk, like uh, the other person was sick, um, or it is uh, too late at night to early in the morning that it might um, influence your communication that you could not understand each other well. And also the second one, I think the second one is quite important. It's about um, the factors from communicators themselves. Um, the first one is that um, we live in society and also in a, in a global society. So people come from different backgrounds, different languages, different cultures, different religions. And it's easier that we cannot understand everything about these people. So something we may understand them like we have some um, overlap information, but sometimes we may lack 
cultural or religious awareness about the other person that we are communicating with. So uh, actually, when we communicate with people from different backgrounds, uh, I think the way we think and we believe since we were young, how we are taught, how we grew up in a certain environment, this form our perception that we have uh, to other people. So when we uh, listen to other people or we get the message of other people, we, this may lead to our judgment, like um, you compare to your own perceptions, your own perspectives, your own belief that this is not correct, this is not right. It should be something like this, like that, or even you giving some advice to other person or even make comparison uh, about uh, the other person's stories and about your own experience or giving commands to the other person. This based on your perception or your own experience. So let's say I, I have some uh, example here. You may see uh, from my name here, right? Yes, this is a very easy and near example. So I'm a Thai person. My name is in Thai. It is Thai language. But now uh, my name is written uh, by uh, English uh, transcription. So you can see that um, the last syllable in my name, if you are an English uh, speaker, when you see, you may think, you may think, I, I, I will not say that all of you may think, all of you think like this, but you may think, what kind of a name is that? You are a woman? How dare you to use that name, right? I, I, I think that there might be some people think about this, right? So, but, but you can actually you can you can yes. say the meaning of uh, that particular yes, word yeah. in Thai. Um, go into what's the meaning of, right. what's the yes. meaning of uh, that so, word in Thai language? So the meaning in Thai is blessing. So you see that is okay. um, really different, very opposite meaning, right? So it's just um the sound that resembles, but the meaning is different. So it is about uh, the language barriers also that form your perception from your judgment. So like my name, uh, your first two syllables, Penja or Panja is five, right? So it means five blessings. It's about um, longevity, status, um, strength, strength and happiness and wisdom. So it, it's quite, it's quite become a good meaning. So I think this is one example that we can see from the message all the time that we perceive right. something, whether uh, the, the verbal or non-verbal message or, or written message. So you can um, think about how you perceive those things, those messages, and how you uh, interpret and how you judge that message. Right. Yes. Hey, I think uh, Dr. Benjapon, uh, the thing is that like what struck me when I get to know your name, uh, Dr. Benjapon, I I try to understand other cultures like so as I think other people as well, especially uh, even the Westerners uh, who might have been in Thailand, and they they understand they probably understand uh, these names exist not even Thai names but also other countries names. Too. I think I think now. We have to look at the good side too. Yes. A lot of people are trying to tolerate uh, other cultures. I, I, I think this is kind of a cosmic uh, ethic, not even the names. Like, as you mentioned in your thesis, uh, you talk about cultural barriers, semantic barriers, the semantic barriers. This is one mm -hmm. example of your yeah, yes. name. Uh, physical barriers, environment, uh, and also the biases, prejudices. This is a very big problem across the world even now. The mm -hmm. color, skin color, and probably uh, the nature of a certain ethnicity uh, so all these are actually now uh, are being viewed different than many you're the young folks uh, now I think somebody who's in Canada for uh, 11 12 years at the moment but even the young folks young folks would like to look at these things from a very tolerating background not even in Canada but also in other countries too only in certain uh, small number of 
people might still and uh, you know uh, not be uh, what you call uh, tolerating probably they don't get this understand probably these things have not been brought to them so okay so barriers in the same in the format of cultural semantic physical environmental and i hope that through internet through discussions like these people get to know a lot of things people understand more so that they try to tolerate more as well okay so finally what can you share with us about how to promote peace without right speech? Now, is right speech the only way to promote peace? Or are there many other channels that we can promote? Of course, it should be. So how do you see that right speech and other channels of promoting peace? Somebody might say, I'm a bad guy. I'm a bad guy. I lie a lot. I talk bad stuff about other people. I insult other people. I am a gossiper. You can't stop me not gossiping. <laughs> so, am I still not? Am I still not bringing peace to other people in my own way? Probably, am I not making myself peaceful? Somebody might ask. You. What's your answer? Yeah. Well, um, I think my speech alone cannot. That do it work so as i mentioned that uh, there are other kinds of uh, qualities or elements like loving kindness compassion patience understanding and uh, the other one that is really important is a uh, mindful observance to your um, feelings your thoughts and other feelings also so if you cannot stop your speaking some kind of wrong speech maybe uh, don't force yourself but maybe you can start a little bit with some kind of practice of listening skill so if you cannot uh, stop wrong speech just adds a little bit with more listening okay go on with your wrong speech but add more listening skill because listening is really important, you know, uh, when we were a baby, right? Uh, the first skill that we have is listen. We cannot speak, right? We listen first. So try to listen with more loving kindness, with more compassion, with patience. Try to listen with all of your heart, without a bias, and mindfully observe when you listen. Observe yourself, observe your feelings, observe your judgments and also observe another person what is the underlying meaning or the underlying feelings of the other person that he does not uh, communicate if you can grasp that at least um, you can help uh, bring a little peace because if you really uh, listen to other person the others will feel that they are hurt they are not alone, they are not left behind. And this is uh, like um, the start of uh, confirming the bonding or the good relationship with each other. Yes. At the same time, we have to always encourage everybody that right speech is not difficult. It's, a, it's an easy thing if you know how to practice it. We are not saying that we have to isolate some folks that, okay, you guys can practice some of our right speech because there are some issues but still there are a lot of possibilities potentials for all of us all of us to practice samma vacha right speak especially as a communication method to, to find peace so uh, i think uh, that's pretty much uh, what we have to talk today especially we talked about what is right speech and i think we did not touch upon the Ambalatika Rahulu Adha Sutta, which means, uh, I guess, uh, Majjhima 61, wherein the Buddha asks uh, Rahula, his own son, uh, after he became a monk, uh, consider speech before, what do you call, you have to think before talk. You have to think while you talk. You have to think after you talk, whether I talk properly or not, affectionately or that, which means, all these are actually adding uh, to an understanding uh, as to how we can practice right speech in a very comfortable, very nice, very altruistic way. Dr. Benjapon, do you have any other thing you want to add? Maybe you can do a kind of a conclusion about this. Uh, so, you want to add anything else you may have missed out on? So I think that um, 
if we're thinking about right speech, uh, um, if we talk about communication, I think what uh, everyone should practice is the listening skill first. With uh, your open mind, observe your thoughts and feelings and judgments, and how can you handle and transform your negative thoughts and feel feelings before delivering the speech? So that is what you should prepare yourself before deliver your right speech. That is how we practice our inner work, and then we start to cultivate our inner peace before we spread it out to. Others, that is, we are creating objectives. Yes, that's all. Awesome. Can we also say, rather saying, practice right speech? Use right speech wise. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Let's say not speaking the not speaking the uh, false speech, but yeah. we may have to sometimes pretend that I'm not going to speak the truth because there are some issues coming up because of that. So I'm trying to sort of not to do that particular activity uh, on a literal sense, but my intentions are good. That means I'm going to use Musawada Vera money from a wise point of view. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I might, a parent, okay, that's a good example. A parent might have to uh, probably uh, say an unpleasant word to uh, their son or daughter, right? But not. But the intention of that speech is not bad because they wanted to, uh, you know, get back their son or daughter to the right track, right? But literally on the surface level, that is a bad parusavacha uh, speech. But but the problem is that we have to bring uh, the idea is we have to bring use right speech wise so that we're gonna make it a good communicator tool. To is that a good way to conclude this, Dr. Benjamin? Yes, of course. Oh, great. Yes. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Benjapon Jambunu. I'm very thankful to you okay. for uh, taking the invitation uh, to this point. Uh, Dhamma folks, today uh, I was joined by Dr. Benjapon Jambunu, who is a visiting lecturer of English at Mahachura Lankor Raja Vidya University in Thailand. Uh, she uh, was able to uh, bring in a lot of interesting insights about this intersection of what you call right speech and peace through uh, the communicative tool. So I'm, uh, I'm thankful to you one more time. Uh, then folks will be uh, tuning in with another episode uh, probably in the future. Stay tuned. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Take care.